There we go. Lord willing, we are, um, we're, our intention was to get out tomorrow. We'll see if that happens or not. I've got a, a decent bit of stuff to do, and um, I'm not sure that that's going to actually end up happening tomorrow, but, uh, but our intention was to leave out tomorrow. I, uh, we were tempted and even prayed about staying longer, and we were willing uh, to stay longer. We really just felt as though the Lord was very clearly directing for us to uh, to get to Illinois. So we uh, we believe that we're following the Lord's leading in that. Uh, although we have appreciated you all and uh, just the blessing that you you all have been, and we have enjoyed um, spending time with you all and getting to know you and. And just our time here, the Lord has been good. Uh, we appreciate being able to be parked here, and uh, it's, been, it's been nice. Um, I, f- I feel like we felt pretty well safe and everything, even though uh, we, there were some homeless living close by when we first uh, came, but I think some of those have since moved on. But anyway, even those didn't, uh, we didn't feel threatened at any point, I don't think, while we were here, so that was a blessing. And... Um, Certainly, obviously, there's significant need here when it comes to homelessness and drug use and drug addiction. It's, uh, it's very evident and, um, and rampant, but the Lord, the Lord can overcome that. You know, the issues that we have in America today, politically, uh, the issues that Sacramento and Los Angeles and uh, Seattle and others deal with because of homelessness, homelessness and other things, many of those people choosing to live homelessly. You know, I've often thought if I was ever going to be homeless, the first thing I would do is try to go find a a homeless shelter of some sort and try to find a place where I could get a a warm bed to sleep in and a meal to eat. And uh, I mean, there are some steps that you normally would take if you were homeless. These are things you would do. And yet some people choose to live homelessly. They choose to not do those things. Many times it is because they are choosing continually to live a lifestyle that includes a lot of drug use and things, and so they're unwilling to cut those things off. Um, but, none, but what I was going to say, though, is all of those things, the drug use, the homelessness, um, the political issues that we have in our nation right now, they all really come back to a single root issue, and that is a spiritual need in our country. Um, if we had, if, if, every, uh, if every person in America were a born-again Christian walking right with God, we wouldn't have any of these issues. We wouldn't have one of them. We wouldn't have the drug use issues. We wouldn't have uh, the homosexuality issues. We wouldn't have transgender issues. We wouldn't have political issues. Um, everyone would have love one toward another in a proper way. We uh, wouldn't be uh, doing those things that would be harmful to uh, our bodies, harmful to others. We wouldn't be uh, in those wrong relationships that are outside of the relationship sanctioned by God's word. But, um, but the problem is that's not where it's at. Everyone in America is not a born-again Christian, and not every Christian that is in America lives the way that we should, and because of that, we have the issues that we have. But uh, there is hope, because uh, we can lead some to the Lord, and we can, we can help turn the tide, and as far as those that are not yet saved, we can try to start and, and work in ministries that will help and, and move even some of those at the very bottom um, to the place where they can be once again functioning citizens that are not only clean of drugs and things, but have a right relationship with God. And I appreciate things like RU and ministries like your church has to, that are specifically focused on that. Um, I think that we, we don't need less ministries like that. We need more. We don't need less uh, reaching out to, to those in need like that. We need more. And it takes a specific heart. It takes, a, it takes thick skin and it takes, um, it takes grace from God to be able to to invest in ministries that oftentimes you don't see a whole lot of return from, uh, though, though God is going to use them and God is going to bless them, but you don't always get to see all the return from those. And so, um, but the greatest needs in our country, though they may seem like they're physical, they may seem like they're political, they may seem like they are all sorts of things, they really go down to the root of a spiritual, spiritual needs. And uh, what I, I believe the Lord wants me to preach on this evening, I, I actually was... I almost announced it this morning, then I kind of forgot to, but uh, it kind of touches into some of those things um, that I even was just mentioning. Um, it is not, not as common to hear um, messages along the lines of what, uh, what I want to preach on this evening, but I, I believe that it is a needed thing. And so what I would like to do is we're going to go first to, um, 
We're going to go first to 1 Timothy 2, 8 and 9. 1 Timothy 2, 8 and 9. I mistakenly uh, referenced 1 Timothy 2, 8 as the verse that the men's meeting was um, using as their text, which it wasn't. It was a similar verse as far as part of the text of the verse, but um, 1 Timothy 2, 8, let me get over here myself. This is Paul speaking, and he said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And then verse number nine says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. And uh, these verses um, address, I think, really two specific needs among Christians today that Uh, They are spiritual needs that are running rampant in our churches um, today. And uh, a while back, the Lord really burdened me to to prepare a message specifically on these two things. And so what I want to preach about this evening uh, is, and again, I almost announced I was going to this morning, but I forgot to, is the perils of pornography and the ills of immodesty. The perils of pornography and the ills of immodesty. And part of this message I preached tonight, I know there's not a whole lot of us here, and yet I think this is what the Lord wanted me to preach. So maybe it'll be for some that watch online. Maybe it'll be for posterity. If anybody listens to it later, I don't know. But but I believe this is what the Lord wanted me to preach this evening. And and hopefully for those that are here, uh, it can be a blessing and a challenge for us. But uh, the perils of pornography and the ills of of immodesty. When Paul here, I think it's interesting how he says this. He says, I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And I referenced this uh, at the two-minute warning, this verse. I don't necessarily believe that when it says lifting up holy hands, it's specifically addressing men actually lifting their hands while they pray. Though, again, I don't necessarily have any issue with that. But I believe that what it's talking about is being able to come before God with clean hands. Being able to, and and clean hands, spiritually speaking, being able to come before God, uh, because this isn't talking about it just going out and working on my car and getting them all greasy and making sure that I wash my hands real good before I come pray. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about washing my hands spiritually, watching, washing my heart, making sure I'm clean before the Lord when I come before him so that, uh, again, as David had mentioned, he said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I know that there's sin in my life and I try to come before God asking him for things, asking him to work, well, the Bible says in James 5, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And uh, it is clean hands that God wants to, to see. Um, I may not have it written down here. The psalm that even talks about who shall uh, ascend into the hill of the Lord, I, I had it referenced in my other, in, in my other message along these lines um, that addresses having clean hands. But it talks about who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord. And it says, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart. And we've got to have clean hands and a pure heart before God. That's the one that God wants to listen to. So the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And uh, God wants us to have a clean hands and a pure heart when we come to, uh, to ascend to him, to talk to him. And so God here, he says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Well, one of the things in America today that is a significant issue, though it's hidden, and no one sees it. No one necessarily knows about it uh, in your life. Or if it were to be in mine, people wouldn't be able to see it. It's th- this very matter of pornography. But it is a significant issue. I'll read just a couple of statistics about pornography. There are um, every day uh, 37 pornographic videos are created in the United States. And these stats are uh, probably a little bit old. But... Um, that's every day. Every second, 28,258 users are watching pornography on the internet. Every second, $3,000 is being spent on pornography on the internet. Every second, 372 people are typing the word adult into a search engine every second. Uh, every day, there are 2.5 billion emails that contain pornography that are sent and received. Every day, 68 million search queries related to pornography. Uh, which is, equals 25%, one quarter of all of the search queries every day on the internet, 25% of them, one quarter of them are related to pornography. 
Uh, 116,000 queries every day are related to child pornography. These are, these are things that are going on. And I know that we would think perhaps, well, this is primarily lost folks, but we'll even get, uh, we'll address in a moment a little bit of even specifically among Christians. But this is, not, this is not something that's only among the lost. And we would do well to recognize and understand that within every church, it's, it, is, um, it has become well known to many pastors that, that many men within their churches struggle with pornography in, in some way or another. Uh, online pornography amongst Americans um, it affects significantly many Americans. About 200,000 Americans are classified as addicts to pornography. About 40 million Americans regularly visit pornography sites. And by the way, that's not all men only either. There are a significant number of, of women that are also involved in this. This is not even when I'm talking about pornography this evening, though it is primarily men that have issues with this, women also struggle with this as well. 35% of all internet downloads, 35%, over a quarter of all internet downloads are related to pornography. 34% of internet users have experienced unwanted exposure to pornographic content through ads, pop-up ads, misdirected links, or emails. And this is the other statistic that I, um, well, I mentioned about women. One-third of pornography viewers are women. 33% are women. So it's not just men that have, that have this as an issue. Among teenagers, and um, again, there may not obviously be teenagers here this evening, but um, teenagers are strongly, they're probably the largest group that are going to be strongly impacted by this, although many adults struggle with it. Teenagers typically are going to be the ones that, are the, that have the strongest impact on them. It increases the odds of teenage pregnancy significant, significantly among teens, pornography and its impact. Uh, it it uh, raises the risk of depression between, um, because of um, the feelings of loneliness that come along with the use of it. And it creates a distorted expectation um, for young men and young women among teenagers. It also affects families. And I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to take the whole evening on these. I'm almost done with this. But um, there's a negative effect on families because of pornography. According to the National Coalition for the Protection of Children and Families, 47% of families in the United States reported that pornography is a problem in their home. Pornography use increases the marital infidelity rate by more than 300%. And so this mentions as well that 40% of people identified as sex addicts lose their spouses, 58% suffer considerable financial losses, and about one-third of them lose their jobs. 68%, 68%, nearly three-quarters of divorce cases involve one party meeting a new, a new partner over the Internet while 56% involve having um, issues in obsessive interest in pornogra pornographic websites. So this is a significant issue in our country today. But it's not just, again, a significant issue in the, among the lost, but among the church. It says, um, amongst the church, let me see what, I've, what it mentions here. 68% of church-going men and over 50% of pastors view pornography on a regular basis, according to some statistics that have been taken. 68% of church-going men, nearly three-quarters of church-going men, that doesn't necessarily mean they're all saved, but nearly three-quarters of church-going men and over 50% of pastors. And again, this is from all types of denominations, but over 50% of pastors view pornography on a regular basis. 59% of pastors said that married men seek their help for porn use. 33% of women and 25 and under search for porn at least once a month. 70% um, of Christian youth pastors report that they have had at least one teen come to them for help in dealing with pornography in the last 12 months. 57% of pastors say that porn addiction is the most damaging issue in their congregation. And 69% say that porn has adversely impacted their church. All that to say... That the issue that I'm addressing this evening to start with, pornography, it's a significant one. And it's one that we need to recognize to be a significant issue. And as Christian men and as Christian women, we need to be willing to acknowledge it for what it is and be willing to um, 
be careful against it in our own lives and be praying for um, others that may be struggling with it, be willing to help others. If we are not personally struggling with it, be willing to be one that can be a help to others that are. I, I know people personally whose lives and ministries have been completely turned upside down because of pornography. And these things come very close to home. But let me now go back to the message itself. In Proverbs chapter number 5, 6 and 7, these three chapters, uh, the idea of pornography and things like it are addressed significantly. And in Proverbs chapter number 7, uh, Solomon, as he's, uh, as he's writing about this matter of um, a man who goes and gets into an immoral relationship with a woman, he describes what goes on in Proverbs chapter number 7. You could read it on your own. I'm not going to read the whole thing right now. But he describes it as a man that is going to a trap. He describes the, him going and he goes and he walks uh, on the street near her corner and then she comes to him and she says all these beautiful words to him and tries to convince him to come and she says the, essentially the, the husband, the good man is not at home, he's gone on a long journey and he's going to come back at the day appointed. And so she, she lures him in and the, the Bible describes it, uh, he says in verse number 22, he goeth after straightway. Goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasteth to the snare. So here a bird is, I mean, he's in a hurry to get to that snare because he thinks it's something good and as soon as he gets to it, he finds out that he's in a trap. And that's what's being described here. So it's describing the man moving toward the trap and it's describing essentially the woman in this context, the strange woman, as the trap. And the purpose, and it even says that she's a woman dressed with the attire of a harlot. And so that dress, that specific type of dress, is part of that trap. And the man is being drawn to that trap. And so both of these issues, and again, we're in our text that we went to in, in uh, 1 Timothy 2, it addresses men lifting up holy hands, and then it addresses women. It says, in like women, that women ad adorn themselves in modest apparel. In like manner. So it's talking about men lifting up holy hands and then women adorning themselves in a certain way. I think it's interesting how he says in like manner as if those two things are connected. Men lifting up their holy hands. Not, not, not necessarily that it's specifically pointing out men lusting after women. Because I don't necessarily think that's what it's talking about, though it could be. But the fact that this is one thing that men need to be doing, lifting up holy hands. And one of the things that women need to be doing is adorning themselves in modest apparel. These are significant things for men, significant things for ladies. And so um, he addresses this as a draw and as a trap. In Galatians 6, 7, Paul says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And in Numbers 32, 23, um, God said, if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. Be sure your sin will find you out. Though these things may be hidden things that people don't know about, these matters of, of porno, porno, pornography or pornographic thoughts, these are things that, though they're hidden to men, God knows about them. So here's what I want to say about pornography, and I'm going to try not to take too, too long on either one of these, but I want to specifically address them as best I can. Pornography in this sin, it begins just in the imagination, that's where it starts, just in the thoughts. But then it moves on and it leads toward immorality, and it eventually ends in immobilization. We think, you know, it's just a little thing. It doesn't matter. It's not a big deal. And so we allow ourselves to look at those things that, don't, that we shouldn't be looking at. We allow ourselves then not only to look at them. Sometimes we can see them and not even purposely see them. They're out everywhere in public. There's, there are people dressed immodestly in public. And so we see things, and we can't help what we see sometimes. But then if we look again, well, that's a choice that we've made. And so it begins in the mind, it begins in the imagination, but then it leads eventually to immorality. And eventually it ends in immobilization. How many men have we known of and heard of, some nationally, and then others that we wouldn't, if, if they were nationally known, they'd have, they'd, have been, uh, they'd have been known about as well. Men that it started in their mind and it ended up pastors and le Christian leaders that ended up in prison or in jail because of Immoral relationships that started with them having wrong thoughts that led to immorality and ended in them being immobilized. And that can happen for any Christian. You don't have to be a pastor to lose your testimony and to lose your, uh, your marriage and to lose your home, all because of things like pornography. 
So here's, here are some things. This is number, number one in relation to this, the deceiver. Um, the lies that the devil spreads. Sometimes he will say, it's okay to look as long as I don't touch. That's a, that's a lie the devil says. Well, as long as I'm not touching. I knew a man that, uh, that he essentially said that very thing. He's like, well, you know, it's okay to look as long as you don't touch. But Jesus said in Matthew 5, 28, I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. It's not okay to look. In fact, when we look and we lust, then God says we're committing adultery in our hearts. Those thoughts are going to continue to manifest themselves in our lives, and they will eventually, if we do not yield them to God, if we do not uh, get cleansing from the Lord, they will eventually lead down a path that leads to destruction. In fact, that's what Proverbs 5 and 6 and 7 talk about over and over again, that her steps lead to hell and that they lead to death, the strange woman. And when men are focused on and thinking on the strange woman over and over again, eventually her path will lead to death and hell and destruction. Another lie that the devil says is he says it doesn't affect anything. You know, nobody knows, so it's not going to hurt anything. But that's, that's really the whole crux of what we're looking at this evening, and that is we need to have holy hands before God. Why is it we have such significant issues in our country right now? Because of hidden sins as part of the issue, that as long as we are unwilling to get rid of the hidden sins in our churches and Christian men's lives and Christian women's lives, if we're unwilling to get rid of these sins, these hidden sins, then we have no clean hands before God, no power with God, no ability to, to get a hold of God and see him work. And so they may be hidden to men's eyes, but we might be believing the lie that it doesn't affect anything, but it's just not true. It does affect things. In fact, it affects significantly our walk with God and our ability to get a hold of God. Here's where, it was Psalm 24, 3 that I was referencing earlier. Uh, it says, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. If we want to be able to get a hold of God, if we want to have his blessing, clean hands and a pure heart. It's easy sometimes to look good on the outside. But you know what happens eventually for anyone that continues down a path of allowing hidden sin? Even the outside eventually stops looking so good. Eventually the outside won't even continue to show it because sin will take its toll. But we might be able to put on a facade for a long time that looks good. But eventually, if we are unwilling to get that heart clean and have our hands clean before God, then we're not going to have God's blessing on our lives. And we see that running rampant across our country. Can I say this? Maybe you're not involved in significant pornographic issues, but if you're watching shows and things that, are, that you're constantly allowing yourself to be looking at things that's, that you are placing before you in modesty and, and putting things before you that are, that are going to put your thoughts in the wrong place, uh, even, even just um, shows and things that make immorality to be no big deal, then those things are going to affect us. The spirit of God that dwells within us is going to be quenched and grieved by us enjoying those entertainments. And we would do well to be careful what things we are allowing ourselves to indulge ourselves in. Another lie that the devil says is that I can handle it. It's not that big. I can handle it. It's just a little bit. You know, a little bit of soft pornography is not going to bother, not going to bother me. I can handle that. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Paul said, Whether there, uh, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. The drunk didn't become a drunk by the first time he ever had alcohol by drinking so much and becoming a drunk every day. Usually that's not the case. Usually they take a little bit. Oh, I can handle it. And then their life becomes overrun by it. The drug addict that's now homeless on the street and won't even find help because he just wants more drugs didn't get there usually because they were seeking to be homeless. They got there because they started with something small and it continued to grow. And the, porno the person that's addicted to pornography doesn't get there by... Um, jumping into all of the hardest stuff initially, they get there because they allow a little bit in, and they keep on allowing, and I can handle it, it's not a big deal. Proverbs 6, 27, again, this is right in that passage of Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 that addresses this specifically a lot. Uh, Solomon says, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? No, of course he cannot. And when we grab a hold of that and we say, I can handle it, we're playing with fire. So, number one, I looked at uh, the deceiver, then the devices that he uses. Uh, Proverbs 6, 18, he uses our imagination. And I mentioned already that it begins in the imagination. Proverbs 6, 18, it says, uh, of, the six, 
of the six things that God hates, yea, seven that are an abomination to him, one of them in the list is in heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. The devil will use the device of just our imagination, just our thought. In fact, though wicked imaginations may not specifically be directed only at pornographic type thoughts, I wonder in even Genesis 6, 5, when it says God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, I wonder how much of that may have been along those lines. Certainly, I'm sure there were many other things as well, but I wonder how much that played a part in it. You know, when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of uh, their fullness of bread and because of their idleness, it, it manifested itself in all sorts of immoral behavior. And I'm sure, I just can trust that in Genesis 6, when God destroyed the earth with a flood, a large portion of it, I'm sure, was because of, and you even see it, that the sons of men went unto the, um, to the, the sons of God went into the children of men, um, the daughters of men, yes. Those things, what, what is that talking about? Some level of immorality. And immorality is a significant issue. Even there, you can see that it was God's people having issues with that. And we've got to acknowledge and then address, and we've got to at least take a look at it sometimes and say we cannot allow this in our own selves. It's a big deal and we can't allow it. In Romans chapter number 1, the passage there describes essentially a downward spiral of unbelieving man. It starts with unthankfulness and it just goes on down until eventually they're in all sorts of homosexuality and, and even worse types of sins. But uh, it says in verse number 21 that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And it starts in the imagination and then it continues to move on. Over in James 1, um, Talking about temptation, it says in verse 13, Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. And then he says, Do not err, my beloved brethren. And this is the exact thing that happens. It starts with, uh, it tarts, starts with temptation, when he's drawn away of lust, and then that lust conceives and brings forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. No, a Christian's not going to die and go to hell, but we can suffer the consequences of our sin to the point that our life is ended prematurely, and that we suffer the consequences of sin, that we have no testimony, and our lives are ruined by sin. So here's the decision that needs to be made in regards to this matter of pornography, the decision that needs to be made. Um, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 and following, Paul says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that's cleansing, that's purification, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Fornication is any type of sexual sin, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. That is us choosing to hold our vessel, our body, in sanctification, cleanness, separation from the world, separation unto God, being holy and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, which is essentially just unbridled lust, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner, matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness." God's called us to holiness. We should not be allowing any of this into our lives. We must be decided that we're going to live holy and righteous, that we're going to have clean hands. It's a decision you have to make. It doesn't happen by accident. You're not going to, you're not going to stop watching things. You're not going to stop looking at things you shouldn't. You're not going to stop thinking about things that you shouldn't accidentally. It'll only happen on purpose. In Romans chapter number 6, when he talks about yield, not yielding our members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but yielding our members as instruments of righteousness to God, when, he talks, when Paul talks about in that Romans chapter number 6, it's clearly a purposeful choice that we make to yield to God and to give our, make that decision for the Lord. And so the decision, we need to make the decision like Job made. He said, I've made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? He said, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? This was Job's decision. We need to make that decision. That I'm going to have a covenant. My eyes, I'm not going to let them look at those things. If I accidentally see something I shouldn't, I'm not going to look at it again, and I'm not going to think upon a maid in an inappropriate manner. 
Psalm 101, verse number 3, uh, I believe it's David there who says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. You know what that is? That's the purposeful choice to set a wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Again, we may not be able to help what we accidentally see, but we can help what we purposely allow ourselves to watch on the television or on the computer or on the phone or whatever it may be. 2 Corinthians 10.4, this is one of the significant ones here. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. This is the choice we have to make. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So not only do we need to make the decision, I will not look at these things, I will not think about these things, but we also then need to say, God, would you search my thoughts? David said in Psalm 139, 23, Search me, O God, know my heart, try me, and know my thoughts. It should be our desire to let God search us and try us and show us, are there areas in my life that I'm allowing these things to grab hold? I want to be careful not to allow these things in. Galatians 5, 16 talks about walking in the Spirit, and if we walk in the Spirit, we're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. So we need to be yielded to the Spirit and therefore not yielding to the, to the desires of the flesh. One other one here, and before we draw kind of to a close on this, is Galatians, excuse me, um, James 5, 16. I referenced the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, but at the beginning of that verse it says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. And the fact is, this is perhaps one of the most significant things, and it kind of even ties in with things like are you and other things. Many times we need this aspect of Christianity, though it's sometimes forgotten, that sometimes we just need somebody to be accountable to. If we are, if we are overtaken in a fault, then we need a brother that can restore such in one. And sometimes we need to, if no one knows that we're overtaking that fault, then we need to go to someone like a pastor or someone that we respect as a godly mentor and say, would you please help me to get victory over this? Would you pray with me about it? And would you hold me accountable? It's not always something that needs to be publicly known, but privately we can go to someone that we respect and say, would you pray with me? And though, again, though I've primarily been maybe addressing men, I don't know, but, but this could be something for men or women. And if this is a struggle that a man or woman is struggling with, these matters of pornography and things like that, then we need to find someone that not only can we get right with God. And yes, can I come before God at any time and get right with him? Certainly. But if I'm going to have victory, sometimes I need to do what James 5.16 says, confess your faults one to another. You know what that requires? Humility. Putting aside my pride that's going to hinder me being right with God and having the humility to say, you know what, I'm struggling with this. Would you pray with me about this? You know what that can be? That can be such a relief of, of a weight and a burden when finally you have somebody else that you know will pray with you and will help keep you accountable about things. Um, I have 10 things that my pastor gave me for people that struggle with pornography. And I'll just go through these quickly and then if you are interested in them, I could always share them with you later again. But um, this doesn't necessarily mean it would be something that even if you wanted them, doesn't necessarily mean it's something that you struggle with. But even if you just wanted these to share with someone else, these were good things my pastor gave me. Uh, he said, if you struggle with pornography, number one, you ought to use a filter on your computer or any other type of device because that can be something that can be helpful. And it can be good not only to use a filter, but to have a filter that your spouse or someone else has the password for and control over so that you do not have the control over it. Using a filter. Number two, having accountability. And that goes to that James 5 where we confess our faults to someone else and they can be praying with us so that we're not just in it alone because many times we need someone else to hold us accountable. Number three, we need to be delighting in the law of God. We need to be praising God. If we're walking right with God, if we're praising God and walking with him, then it's going to push us away from things that are ungodly. It's going to be pushing us away from those things. And so if we're delighting in the law of the Lord, then that will help us to um, be, be moved away from these things. Number four, recognize the damage that pornography does. You know, if we would really acknowledge how much damage takes place because of pornography, it might help us to stay away from that, to not choose to do that any longer. Um, devote time with spouse and family is number five. Sometimes these things are issues because there's not a proper and appropriate amount of time being spent with one's spouse or with one's family. If you're spending time with your spouse and your family, then you're not going to be spending time on things that you shouldn't be spending time with. Number six, understanding the chemical element that's involved and causes dependency. 
Sometimes people think, well, I can just gain, gain victory over this on my own, but they've become so addicted to these things that the only time they're going to get victory is if they have someone that, is account- that they're accountable to because there is a chemical element. Your body has now become dependent upon it. It's become accustomed to it. And there is actually a chemical element that sometimes needs something greater than your own strength and ability. Obviously, dependence upon the Lord, but sometimes also accountability with someone else. Um, number seven, it's not victimless. Sometimes the idea of looking at pornography, many, many people that are, in, that are involved in uh, the pornography that's out there and available, not only is it harmful to you, but it's harming the people that are being used to take those pictures. Many of them are, are victims of sex trafficking and other things involuntarily. And they're being used to give you pleasure, to give men or women pleasure, but they're being trafficked for that. And so it's, vic- it's not victimless. It's not only harmful to you, not only harmful to the family around you, but it's harmful to the ones that are a part of that pornography industry and other things. Number eight, recognize that you are never alone. You know, nobody else may see you when you're involved in looking at those things and thinking about those things, but Christ is there. And if you're a Christian, the Spirit of God is having to endure that as you quench him. Number nine, recognize the emptiness that it brings. You know, when I talk to those teenagers in Rush Park and talk to them as they're sitting there smoking weed and, and uh, as they're involved in all their, their sin, that they're, uh, it, I, I try to challenge them about the fact that there is no fulfillment in what they're involved in. And the fact is, a Christian that's involving himself purposely in sin over and over again, you're going to miss out on the peace and fulfillment that comes in the right relationship with God. It just brings emptiness. There's no long-term fulfillment in it. Eventually, you're going to get tired of it. Yield it over to the Lord. And then number 10, pray that God would give victory, thank God for the victory, and study Scripture related to the issue, memorize it, and gain victory in that way as well. And so this is that matter of pornography. And I usually do... um, I spent a good bit of time on that. I'm not going to spend as much time, but I want to take at least a few more minutes and talk about this matter of immodesty. Men are going to struggle one way or another more often than women with pornography, but both can, as has already been mentioned. About 33% of those that are involved in pornography are women. Um, Men will struggle with it one way or another, but something that I think is important for us to recognize is that Christian women should purposely try not to add to that struggle. You know, men are going to struggle with it one way or another, but Christian women should strive not to be a stumbling block or a hindrance. Solomon mentions in Proverbs 5, I think it's so interesting how in Proverbs chapter number 5, as as Solomon is talking about the strange woman and talking about um, men not following her, it says uh, the lips of a strange woman in verse number 3, they drop as in honeycomb, her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword, her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell, lest thou shouldst ponder the path of life, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Listen, if you read Proverbs 5, 6, and 7, and you uh, get yourself a cus- uh, well-known, well-averse to those, you'll see that Solomon constantly is addressing these. But he gets down and he says, um, in verse number 14, I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. So what Solomon there is saying, he's saying in the midst of the in the midst of the, the, the congregation, the assembly of believers, I was almost in all evil. So he was nearly overtaken in this, essentially in what would have been his church in that context, in that day. And it it's a sad thing, but how many times does adultery take place within a church context? Or how many times do men struggle with pornography and perhaps they can be hindered at least because of even Christian women that are not cognizant of what they're doing and how they're acting, how they're dressing. And so this is an issue that, again, women are not responsible for the actions or thoughts of men. They're not responsible for it. Men are responsible for those, but they can impact them. And so there is, there should be a desire, if nothing else, within the hearts of a Christian lady that I want to be careful not to not to be a stumbling block and a hindrance. And so I wanted to share some scriptures in this matter. And again, even just going back to our, to our text uh, in 1 Timothy, um, the, right after he talks about having clean hands and a pure heart, or excuse me, when he talks about lifting up holy hands, he says, in like manner that women should adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety. The mindset that's being described here in these verses is that, that dress should be something that 
one would be very careful about. Very careful in the way that they're dressing. Trying to be careful to be godly in dress. Trying to be very careful. Not, not, um, not, not um, just without any thought about it. Not, not thoughtless in their dress. But purposely striving to be glorifying to God. Modest. And uh, it says, uh, which becometh women professing godliness with good works. In verse number 10. So, a couple other verses that the scripture address and some principles about this. And by the way, though modesty is specifically addressed here with women, do you know that modesty is important for men and women? And I think sometimes this is forgotten for men. But do you know that one of the first times that modesty was addressed in the Bible was addressed to men. It was addressed to the priests. It was addressed to them about how they would make sure that they would not uh, uncover themselves, that they would not be seen, that their, their thigh would not be seen, that their nakedness would not be seen over in Exodus 28. And so modesty is something for men and women, especially in the culture in which we live. It kind of shows itself why it's so important. You know, even among some Christian schools and Christian contexts, sometimes men are a little bit you know, a little careless or thoughtless about what they wear. They're out maybe uh, playing golf in shorts that are way up and showing half of their leg, or they're playing basketball, and sometimes basketball shorts in the past were real common to show 90% of a guy's legs, and it was just the normal thing, as ugly as it was. But, um, but, that was, but, it, but the fact is, when it comes to modesty, scripturally speaking, the first place that God ever addressed nakedness, he addressed it with, uh, or at least one of the first places where he addressed nakedness, he addressed it with the priests and not the uncovering of the thigh, making sure they didn't uncover their thigh in Exodus 28. And by addressing it that way, it appears that somewhere in your thigh starts showing nakedness. And that's why for, for many of us, we've, we, we say, well, well, I don't know where that line exactly is, but I know where my thigh starts, so I think it's been prudent for us to try to not show the thigh because somewhere in there, again, you're showing nakedness. And we should, it sh what I'm talking about now and for the next few minutes, for those that are watching and those that are listening, if a person doesn't, doesn't care about modesty, doesn't care about showing their nakedness, then it's not going to matter. But if we truly are striving for and wanting to be modest and not show our nakedness, then we should be saying, well, what does the Bible say about that? And what are some things that I can do to apply these things to my life? Well, I should be striving to uh, be modest. And again, men showing nakedness, I wonder how much of that impacts even homosexuality in our day. You know, you've got, you've, got, um, you've got men that are they're careless about the way that they dress, and God specifically said for men not to do that, and, and you think, well, it's not a big deal, and, and who even really would, who's even lusting after a man's legs anyway, because most of the time, I mean, really, who is? But the fact is, maybe more than you think. Maybe it's more of a stumbling block than we might think, just because we don't feel like it's an issue. It's not really a matter of whether I think it's an issue anyway. If God has said that I'm supposed to be modest and cover my nakedness, then I need to do that whether or not I feel like it's a big issue or not. And that's just for men, not to mention women, which we know that men are drawn toward the nakedness when women are showing it. And so all the more, something that's all the more of a struggle, women, uh, godly women, Christian women, should be striving for and desiring to be modest, but not just modest. Because that's just one aspect of, of Christian dress for men or women. But another thing that is a principle that should always apply to anything, and this is something that got me when I was in high school, is that 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. If God cares about me eating and drinking and the smallest things like that, and it all needs to be glorifying to him, then that means whenever I get dressed, I should be striving to not just glorify myself, I should be striving to glorify God. That's a purposeful choice. There was a time in high school where God really strongly convicted me and I had to get rid of, I know it was over $1,000 worth of clothes because I just had, I wanted to have all these popular clothes and God convicted me. I was just dressing to glorify me. But it was worldly and it was prideful and I needed to make some changes that would make it to where my dress was pointing toward him, not just to myself. So some principles for dress are glorifying to God, not just glorifying to me. Some principles for dress are modest. And, um, you know, the idea of modesty is not the idea of look at me. Because what is a modest person? Well, that person's so modest. It's somebody that they, they don't want the, the, the direction to be pointed at them. 
A modest person is somebody that's, hey, you know, they're trying to push the, 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 the people's sight away from them. I don't want to draw everyone's attention to me. I want to push the attention away from me. Pushing the attention toward God should be our desire. So a modest person, it's not even all only about how much skin I'm showing, but am I drawing attention to myself or am I drawing attention to God? Am I striving to in what I'm doing, trying to point toward the Lord? There's obviously, within that, there's going to be some room for gray area. There's not, I, I'm not telling you exactly where you're going to draw your lines, but our desire should be to glorify God, not self. And so modest, but then also not worldly. Over and over again in the Scripture, we're told not to be conformed to this world. We're, ter- we're told to be, uh, we're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're told to be separate, touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. So God says, don't be worldly. I shouldn't be striving to be following all the latest trends. These are principles of Scripture that apply to many areas of our lives, but dress is one of them. And another one that the Bible very clearly, um, it, it makes it clear in the Old and New Testament, is that we should be gender distinctive in our dress. And different people are going to draw their lines in different places with this, but it ought to be modest, gender distinctive, not worldly, and glorifying to God. We went into a, a candy store the other night. I didn't even realize it. My wife told me, I was only in there for a minute, but my wife said, did you see that? That guy was cross-dressing. And it's an uncommon thing usually. It's less common for men to be wearing women's clothes, but it's becoming more common in our day. And the devil would say, there's no distinction. There doesn't need to be any distinction. Men can wear women's clothes. Women can wear men's clothes, and there's there's no distinction needed. But God, over and over again in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, made it clear that men and women are distinct, and they should be distinct, and it should be noticeably distinct. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame to him. Now that's just talking about hair there. But what is that distinction there? There's a difference between men and women. God made us different. And he addressed in the Old Testament about men not wearing that which pertains to a man or women putting, uh, men putting on a woman's garment. And though some people are quick to say, well, you don't obey the rest of the areas of the Old Testament law. Why would you obey that one? Well, some of the principles that God has given in the Old Testament still have some clear application for us today in men and women being distinctive and God making us different and there ought to be a visible difference is one of those things. Just the fact that he, he wants us to be distinctive. Men are not women. Women are not men. And there should be distinction between the two. And so, again... Where each person draws those lines about modesty and glorifying to God and not worldly and gender distinctive, they may be slightly different for each one. But the question is this, I think, for part of us is, what are we aiming for? What is our goal? And are we striving to not be close to the world, not be close to the line? Are we striving to be godly? Am I striving as a a Christian woman? Am I trying to purposely make sure that I'm pleasing the Lord in my dress? Or am I just kind of flippant about that. And so part of that also comes back to humility. It's this idea is the opposite of the idea of nobody's going to tell me what to do. I I know some Christian ladies that this, when I, if I ever address an issue like this, modesty, they say no man ought ever address that. This is something only for women. Well, the fact is the older women are supposed to teach the younger women, but also Paul addressed these things. So apparently it's okay. And the Bible addresses these things, so apparently it's okay. Now, I would rather not to ever have to address these things. I would rather that that the Spirit of God through the Word of God and 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 older women just take care of those things. But the fact is, if a a Christian lady has the idea of, don't tell me what to do, don't address me, that's not your concern, that's the wrong type of attitude. The attitude ought to be, I want to do what's right. I want, to, I want to have a biblical mindset and a biblical heart, and I, and I don't want to be close to the line. I want to be far away from the line of, of immodesty. I don't want to be a stumbling block. There are some, some Christian women who say, well, if, if he's got a problem, that's his problem. Well, that's, that's not the right attitude. The attitude ought to be, I, don't, I want to, as best I can, not be a stumbling block. Again, sometimes, no matter what you do, some men are going to struggle. They're going to fail. But, but the attitude ought to be one of, of shamefacedness and sobriety. A look-at-me dress often comes with that look-at-me attitude as well. And uh, we, we better be careful about, about these things. You know, it's a sad thing to me to have seen even Christian guys that I knew in college and other places that have ended up in homosexuality and things. And I just, again, I wonder how much these things that we think, it's not that big of a deal, modesty and you know, other things, even amongst men, how much it may have even impacted those. Not to mention how many Christian men have fallen, perhaps because, partially, because they were constantly, even within the church house, like 
like Solomon, being confronted with immodesty. It's, it's not on the women 100% clearly. It's on the men for what choices they make. But Christian women should be desiring to not be a stumbling block. That's all that I'm trying to say there. And uh, there are other things I could say, but last passage I'm going to read through here is 1 Peter 3. It says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also obey the, the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. That's the lifestyle. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. The idea here, again, in this passage is the thing that ought to be the most visible in a Christian lady's life is not all of the outside dress, but it ought to be that godly spirit coming forth. That ought to be the goal and desire of any Christian lady. Not that my, my dress is attractive and I'm drawing everyone with how good I look, but rather that they see that hidden man of the heart, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, Titus 2 does talk about the older women teaching the younger woman. And that's a valuable and important thing that I think sometimes is lost and missed. We've got men's meetings sometimes. Uh, I don't know if there are any ladies' meetings that go on around here, but those are valuable things because there need to be uh, older godly women that can say, here's what the Bible says and here's some things that, that we've learned. Sometimes younger women don't know any better because they also haven't perhaps been married yet and don't have a husband and they don't know some of the ways that men think that a, a married woman might understand a little bit better, especially a woman that's maybe been married for a long time and who understands the way that her husband thinks and, and, and that can impact then the way that an older lady can teach a younger lady. But there are significant problems that can come with immodesty. Not only can it harm and hinder um, Christian men around, but it also can lead toward immorality. Because with that look at me attitude, sometimes can come a, a willingness to, when a Christian man or someone else comes and starts to show a little bit of interest, and, and the husband maybe isn't showing as much interest as he ought to be, then sometimes those relationships can quickly lead to something that they shouldn't. And there needs to be a desire to please God and glorify him with our decisions. And in all of these things, for men and women, we need not be making excuses for why it's okay for me to look at those things or why it's okay for me to dress this way or why it's okay for me to, to do these things that I'm doing, but rather we need to be honest before the Lord and say, Lord, I want to be right with you in these matters. I want to do whatever it takes to cleanse myself of these things, and I don't want, to be, I don't want this to be a stumbling block for me so that I can't get a hold of your throne and so that my country and my church and my family are not held back. I do wonder if just this matter of pornography and the matter of immodesty within just our churches, if just those two matters, pornography and immodesty within our churches, if only those two were completely eradicated, I wonder how significant the difference would be in our churches in America today. If just those two were completely removed. And they are significant issues and we need to try as best we can to yield ourselves to the Lord in these things. And try to help brothers and sisters in Christ have victory in these things. We need to have a spirit of humility, a spirit of long-sufferingness with others. But, but if we can see victories in these areas, they are strongholds in our country. And you know what? It may mean that you need to delete a subscription because you are constantly being stumbling because of that subscription. It may mean that you need to get rid of a, a device that you have. It may mean that you need to um, make some changes about where you drive every day if there's something that you're seeing every day. It may be that you need to uh, do whatever it takes. It may mean that you need to get rid of some clothes that you've got. It may mean that you need to uh, do some things that are going to maybe even have some cost to you financially. But if it's going to help you to be right with God, to not be a stumbling block to others or to, to allow those things to be a stumbling block to yourself, then it's worth it. It's worth it for you, it's worth it for your family, it's worth it for your church, it's worth it for your country, because we need Christians that can be lifting up holy hands before God, that can be getting a hold of the throne of God. How are we going to see revival in our land if we're not clean, if we're not able to come before God, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much? And so part of my burden, again, for our nation is revival, but how are we going to have revival as long as we have hidden sins that we're unwilling to deal with and we're not addressing so may God help us to have victory in these areas of, of pornography and immodesty. May we purposely have a humble spirit and be decided that we're going to allow the Spirit of God to help us to have victory in these matters. 
Lord, I pray that you would take these thoughts, your word. I pray that you would help uh, Christian men and women to have victory over pornography, whether it be significant issues or even perhaps less significant issues, but allowing themselves to yield to these temptations. I pray that you'd give Christians victory over these matters, these things that could be hindering our walk with you. I pray that you'd help some Christians perhaps to even remove things in their lives that don't belong, things that would be hindering their walk with you, things that would be hindering not only their walk, but perhaps their family or their church, holding back our country from seeing the revival we need, certainly holding back individuals. And I pray that you'd help um, men and women that perhaps are even allowing immodesty in their lives or allowing different aspects of their dress to not be pleasing to you. I pray that you would help them to be willing to make whatever decisions are needed And that would be pleasing to you to gain victory in these things, to be pleasing to you, to be careful. And Lord, I pray not only for for this church and those that may watch online, but I pray all across our land that you would help our churches to to make a big deal of holiness again. And help Christians to make a big deal of these things in our lives again, that you'd be glorified. And that uh, we would be able to see some of these strongholds removed in our land. I pray these things for your glory and for our good, in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll have...